Hello, blessed day everybody. Welcome once again to the first series you've been anticipating for such a long time. Enoch and Elijah died physically. So, you know, invite people, begin to invite people, share the broadcast, tag people, comment, mention them. And, you know, today to be a very wonderful day. And I beg that, you know, you, you, you follow patiently and listening. And also you take your notes and you take down everything that we are going to speak about. Father, we bless your name. We honor you for tonight. We bless your name. We thank you, Lord, for all the people who are watching us right now. We pray that your word resonates on our inside. We pray that in the name of Jesus, mindsets are destroyed. We pray that we are equipped with knowledge to understand our spirits are open, to understand, to receive the revelation of the scriptures. And at the end of today, we'll be edified and you'll be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, bless everybody for coming in today. That's the beginning. So today... We are starting with the introduction, uh, looking about uh, about the about Enoch and Elijah. Did they die? Yes or no? Uh, sorry for for those who want uh, to be invited on the guest. I'm sorry today. I I have a limited time right now. It's uh, in Canada. It's in the night, so I do not have time f uh, to go into a conversation. But you can hang on a bit. Uh, when I'm done, I can invite you absolutely. So you know, first I would say that for centuries, you know, the body of Christ, you know, have been fed divers of manners uh, of doctrines. There are lots of doctrines that have been introduced in the uh, in the Christendom. Things like, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we leave it online. Things like the doctrine of election, which is Calvini Calvinistic viewpoint, you know, where they say God predestined some people to go to hell, some people to be saved, and sort of thing. There are many doctrines, doctrines of deliverance, which they make you believe, you know, that you need to go every day. To... There are so a lot of things, but today I will focus on this one. You know, we have fed many, many, there are a lot of things that are crazy in the Christendom. If you don't study the Bible, you be fooled. So, and you know, the problem is that, you know, firstly, it's either, you know, we don't read our Bibles. Thirdly, secondly, it's you can read your Bible, yes, be zealous and read it, but you don't have a teacher who has uh, taught you how to correctly interpret the Word of God and properly handle it. So, if you do, if you are lazy, yes, catch up, pull up your socks and start reading the Bible. If you read it with zeal but you don't understand it, you need to sit down under a teaching priest and let the teaching priest tutor you Bible, biblical doctrine. Hallelujah. So, you know, that's what today we are going to look. You know, Paul told us, you know, to be aware of doctrines that are not of Christ. So, the problem I say, how can you know the right doctrine if you don't know first what is wrong? If you don't know the wrong element, you will never know uh, the wrong doctrines, especially in these days where there is a multiplicity of wrong doctrines flying all around. So, you know, here firstly, let me tell you here what we'll be focusing from beginning this series going forward. I will look at what the Bible says only, only what the Bible says, whether they died or not. This is not my opinions, right? We go through the scriptures together. And of course, you know, in the past, you know, I, I believed it that, you know, they, ne they never died. They went to heaven with bodies. I also, because I had read some apocrypha books, I believed uh, that they were going to come again as the three witnesses. So many things. So what I beg that today we start with the origin of the root. So we are going first to look at the origin of the root. <clears throat> now, before I start this, I'll say, when we want to solve every doctrinal problems, we have first to go to Old Testament, Genesis. Because the Old Testament, that's where the apostolic teachings come from. That's why they come from. You find Paul is referencing to the Old Testament as the scriptures. Jesus is the scriptures. Peter is the scriptures, which, which tells you that the Old Testament is scriptures. So whenever we have a doctrinal problems, we have to rush back to the Old Testament. So for me, it's Genesis. So you know that in the beginning, God created a man. Now, I, did not, I, I deliberately left out the plan of salvation out because I will introduce it later. So, and you know that when he created a man, you will read this verse in all, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 1 to 2. The Bible says, in hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised before the world began. 
That means God's promise before he created Adam was life. Before he made the earth was life. Before he says, let this be, was life. So the promise of God already, before anyone existed, before even the angels were created, was life. I'm going to give life to man. That's why the Bible says, in hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised before the world began. So, and I said this, let me, let me say this. So, when God created Adam, the first thing you should notice this. Adam was not a sinner, and he was neither holy. He was not unrighteous, and he was not righteous. He was not mortal, and he was not immortal. So, get these facts before first we go into these things. So, Adam was not mortal, he was not immortal. He was neither uh, a sinner, he was neither holy, he was neither righteous, he was neither unrighteous. You see that? God now gave him a faith. You need to choose your faith. You need to choose your destination. So God placed two options there. You choose which one to follow. You determine your own destination. So God gives man free will and says, here it is. I give you free will. You choose the way there which you take. So now, if Adam was not mortal, he was not mortal. Where do we get that thing? Where do we get, where do I get it? When we say Adam was a sinner, was not sinner, where do we get it from? Let's go. Uh, open your Bibles in Romans chapter 5 verse 12. And remember I said, if you are following, please make sure you take notes. This will help you so much and revise it. In case I speak to you lies, you go back and fact check and say, hey, evangelist, you are lying. Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Now, not something. Sin entered the world. Now, sin entered, the Greek word for enter is esekomai, which means a foreign object has been introduced. Esekomai. A foreign object has been introduced. Now, sin entered into the world. While it entered. Now, how did it enter? Through Adam. Now what's the consequence of sin? Death. Death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Now when it's saying all sinned, it's not meaning that all sinned. No, in Adam, everyone has sinned. As long as you are the product of Adam, all sinned. So in Adam, all are sinners. <laughs> That's why there is the first Adam, there is the last Adam. In the first Adam, all are sinners. In the last da Adam, all are justified. Right? But you know, so you can say, okay, do you mean all of us, we are, we are born again? Now let me show you something. In Adam, you are a sinner automatically. However, to stay a sinner, it's your, just, it's your decision. To remain a sinner, it's your choice. Why am I saying this? Because God has sent his only son. To take away your sin. So for you to remain a sinner. It's your choice. You see that. So in Christ. Every man. According to the plan of salvation. Salvation is available to them. Eternal life is available to them. Righteousness is available to them. Deliverance from sin is available to them. However they can choose to appropriate it or not. That's why the gospel first has to be preached. The man has to believe. When he believes, he becomes in Christ. So, le let me not drift away. So, sin entered. That's why you know Roman said, uh, Paul said, for the wages of sin is death. Now, you agree with me that wages means that you are being paid for a service rendered. In other words, death is a payment for a job well done. In other words, when you have done a very good job, you are commendable, you are like, Wow, you have worked this the end result of your month. You receive this paycheck. So which means the wages of sin is death, which means death is a payment for service. Well done. Which means man was paid death because of sin. So you see, sin entered the world through Adam and death entered through sin. Now this death is talking about it's not physical death. It's spiritual death. F spiritual death, the mother of physical death. So death entered through sin. That means Adam became a mortal man after he disobeyed the word of God. Now remember I said Adam was created not mortal, 
neither immortal. So that's why now I'm beginning to show you where do we get this from. Now you see death enters when man disobeys, according to Romans chapter 5 verse 12, which means that before Adam sinned, he was not mortal. Okay? Because when death comes, that's when man begins to die. However, remember I said, when you read the, uh, the original rendering in Hebrew lexicon, when the Bible, when God is telling them, in the day you will eat the fruit, it says, thou shalt die, die death. In the original. Which means, thou shalt die, die death. Why die, die death? Spiritual death. Then physical death. Spiritual death, the mother, which manufactures physical death. So now we see, if Adam died after he disobeyed, it means he was not mortal before he disobeyed. Go to James chapter 1, 15. James chapter 1, verse 15. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So you see, desire brings sin. Okay? And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. <laughs> so sin is the mother of death. Okay? So now, this sin which is talking is being talked about this sin. It's not this lying and what. This is a sin. It's a sin. It's not this sin's lying, uh, uh, stealing. This sin, it's a specific sin. Sin, sin. It's a kind of sin. That's the kind of sin Jesus talks about again. That it's unforgivable. The, we call it the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. So now he says, desire conceived, which means Adam had a desire to sin. How did that desire come? God gave man the desire, that desire. So can we say God gave the man ability to sin? Yes. Did he give him the ability to choose? Yes. So Adam could choose whether to sin or not. Remember, this sin is not fornication. So get me, when I'm saying that God gave man the choices, I'm not saying he gave him, uh, well, what I'm talking about is not stealing, thieving, lying, no. This sin is the rejection of the gospel. Because God preached the gospel to Adam, now we go slowly there because it will come later. Now, Adam had a desire, the desire gave birth to sin, then sin gave birth to death. So we can say sin is the mother of death. Okay, that's why the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So therefore we know that death did not exist until Adam transgressed. I'm going slowly there. Death did not exist until Adam transgressed. Let's look at Romans chapter 5 verse 15. But the gift is not like the transpass. If the many died by the transpass of one man. So the many died. Why? Because of the sin of Adam. In other words, you can say the gift is not like the sin of Adam. For if the many, the many is all human beings, the mankind, died by the sin of one man, who is Adam. So now death comes in by sin. Okay, look at verse 17. For if by the transpass of one man, death reigned through one man. So we can conclude that sin led to death. So before Adam sinned, there was no death. So we have seen that Adam was not mortal until he disobeyed, until he sinned, okay? And so I said that Adam was not immortal too. He was held in between mortality, immortality. Choose which, okay? So now let, 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 let's, go, let, let's go now to was Adam immortal, okay? Firstly, we have seen that Adam was not mortal. So was he immortal? Now look at Titus chapter 1 verse 2 to 3. In the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie, God cannot lie, okay, promised before the world began. In his own time, he has made his word evident in the proclamation entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior. So he says, in the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie, promised before the world began that means before the world began what was the promise of god eternal life before adam was created what was the promise of god eternal life so god promised man eternal life even to adam god promised him eternal life okay and we know what is eternal life immortality you can say eternal life is immortality right so the promise of god was eternal life before and after creation 
So you can substitute that word eternal life for immortality. So you can say God promised immortality to man. Which means that Adam had no immortality. Otherwise it would not be a promise. Okay? If man had immortality, God would not promise it. It would never be a promise. Do you see that? So if he was immortal, death would never have existed. And he would never have died. Do you get my knowledge there? If he had uh, all these things, which we are talking about, look at 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. So God promised eternal life in Titus 1. Uh, let me go to Titus chapter 1, 2 to 3. In the hope eternal life which God cannot lie promised before the world began. Where did he promise this eternal life? 2 Timothy 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of eternal life, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. So God promised Adam life in Christ Jesus. In other words, God told Adam, you need to accept Jesus. <laughs> you know, that's why I say, firstly, you realize the Bible has principles. It has standards. It has patterns. In the Old Testament, God establishes a pattern, a standard. That's why, you know, today, when we say, you know, you need to receive Jesus, it's not a new thing. It's not a New Testament thing. Yes, I heard one man of God was saying, you know, those who were before Jesus, who died, you know, how were they saved? They said they never had Jesus, so they did not have to put their faith in Christ, uh, but they had to believe in some other things which God saw, which, you know, it's some truth, but it's not the whole some truth. The whole truth is that the standard of God has remained unchanged. Remember Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, which means Christ has never changed. So which means the standard of God which he shows, it's consistent. So if now today we need to put our faith in Jesus to be saved, it means that is the same standard in Genesis. That's the same standard in Deuteronomy, in Exodus, in Numbers, in the prophets, in Psalms, until when Jesus arrives. So one standard, God channels it through the generations. So you see that. So God promised Adam life in Christ. In other words, he told him you need to receive Jesus to have eternal life. So the promise of life was in Christ Jesus. So Adam had to be born again to receive eternal life. He was not born again. That's why you know if you meet a seven day Adventist will tell you Adam was holy. No, 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 no. So this is very, very crucial for you to understand this. So man was not immortal. All right. So, and I said the promise of eternal life was in Christ. So the promise of immortality to man was only through Jesus Christ. When you are reading this verse here, it was through Jesus Christ. And how was it through Jesus Christ? It was relayed through the gospel, the preaching of the gospel. And God had to preach it to Adam. But you, you ask me, how did he preach to Adam? Did he come to Adam and say, Adam, here I am, you know, I've come to preach to you the good news? While in John 1, 17 to 18, Jesus says, no man has seen the Father at any time. Jesus says, no man. Is Adam a man? Is Moses a man? Is David a man? Anyone who, who the Old Testament claims he saw God, is he a man? Well, let me tell you, Jesus is not a prophet. Jesus is not a prophet. Jesus is not a mere man. Jesus is God speaking for himself. So he says, no man has seen God at any time. Eh? That's Jesus talking. So do you believe Jesus or should you believe Moses? Or should you believe the prophet? I believe Jesus because he is God. And Jesus says, no man has seen God at any time. So which means even Adam never saw God at any time. All right. Let me just stop there. So let me, let's go, let, let's go on. Let's go on. So now, according to what we've been reading, Adam never received immortality. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 to 10. He has served us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our own works, but by his own purpose and by grace. He granted us in Christ Jesus before time began. Before time began. Before the creation. 
And now he has revealed his grace through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has abolished death and illuminated the way to life. And that is immortality through the gospel. Do you see that? Let me read it again. He has saved us, called us to a holy calling, not because of our own works, but by his own purpose and by the grace he granted us in Christ Jesus before the time began. And now he has revealed his grace through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has abolished death and illuminated the way to life, that is, immortality through the gospel, which means Jesus illuminates the way to life, which is immortality. Now, the gospel brings immortality. Do you see that? Illuminated the way to life, and that is immortality through the gospel. So, Jesus now, that means Jesus makes the way to immortality clear. That's what the Bible is trying to say. The Jesus unveils the way to life. That's why in John uh, 14, 6, 6, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to me except through Jesus. So Jesus makes the way open. In other words, he gives, he, he shows clearly the way to immortality. And how is immortality channeled? Through the gospel. Do you see that? So eternal life was the plan of God from the beginning before he created the world. So eternal life is salvation, you know, that for John 3, 16, right? So when Adam was created, he was not created righteous. He was not created holy. Mm -mm. He was not created mortal. He was not created immortal. He was in between, in between the choices to choose which. God gave him the ability to choose which. Which one should you choose? Immortality, mortality. Sin, holiness. God, or choose sin. Death or eternal life. You see that? So, we cemented it right now that Adam was not immortal and he was not mortal. He was to receive Jesus in order to receive eternal life. But because he rejected Jesus, he chose death. Now, that disobedience to the word of God was the sin. That disobedience was the sin. And that sin resulted into death. And remember I said that death is spiritual death. Look at Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. No, Genesis chapter 2 verse 17. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Instantly. It says in the day, the moment instantly you eat the fruit from the tree of good and evil. You will surely die immediately. Now, you need to note that word. If you are taking notes, just underline that word. You will surely die. You will surely die. Now, the soul of man, let, let me just uh, interrupt by saying this. The soul of man was destined to eternal hell by man himself. The body of man decayed in the ground. That's why God said, from dust you came, and from dust thou shalt return. So now, that means when we see the tree in verse 17, <laughs> let, me, let me put it down so that I, I, I do not confuse someone right here. So when we see the tree in verse 17, I don't know, should I really say this? <laughs> All right, let me leave it. I will come to it again. All right. So let me just say, verse 17, what we are seeing is the tree of mortality. In other words, we can say the tree of good and evil is the tree of mortality. That means when you die, you become mortal. But you will not something. I'm leading you somewhere. Just follow me patiently. Now, remember what have I been saying? That death is not physical death. Is what? Spiritual death. Follow carefully. Go to Genesis chapter 3 verse 22. Now from what we've been reading from Genesis chapter 2 17. God tells him in the day you will eat. You will instantly die. Look at Genesis chapter 3 22. The Lord said to God. The, then the Lord God said. Behold man has become like one of us. One of us doesn't mean he has become. No. It means he has become independent like one of us. Like us. 
Now the plan of God was that man should be dependent on Christ, not to be independent. Independence of man, that was, that was what led to fall. So now man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take out of the tree of life and eat and live forever. In other words, God said, now remove the tree of life, lest if he eats from it, he will live forever. He will live forever. But you know, when you read the original manuscript, it's not like God chased man from the tree of life. In, in other words, the word that used death for uh, behold, man has become now lest he put forth his hand and take also from the tree of life. In the original entering, it's God pointed man back to life. Right? Adam is dead. He needs life. So now, it's not God chasing Adam from the tree of life. It's God pointing man back to the tree of life. Because the tree of life is salvation. Now, if you haven't understood or if you haven't followed Papa, you know you will not know the tree of life, what he is talking about. Alright? So now, which means that God is pointing man back to the tree of life. Alright? Now, let, let, let's look at man has become like one of us. It's independence. All right. And I have already said it, that God wanted man to totally depend on him. But he gave him free will to choose. That's why you are not a robot. All right. So Adam wanted to be independent. And that independence is what led to be without God. Independence is to be far from God. If you do not want to submit to Christ, you want to be cut away from Christ. Now, but remember, Satan told them something. He says, if they ate the fruit, uh, 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 let, let me see, let me see. Mm. He says, if you eat the fruit, you'll be like God. So the, the devil told them that the tree of the forbidden, the forbidden tree or the tree of the forbidden fruit was a marvelous tree. And that it will make them gods. And they will be like God. <laughs> but he's a lie. He's a liar. So the tree of life, I can say, is the source of eternal life. Or immortality. Now, if you don't know the tree of life, I would just say that the tree of life is Christ himself. And I will go into it later. Right? But it's Christ in figures of speech. Alright, so now... Let me come back to this. Adam was held bound in between two choices. Death, life, mortality, immortality, righteousness, unrighteousness, holiness, unholiness. So he was held in between to choose which one he was going to choose. Are you getting what I'm saying? And Adam now, he rejected immortality. He rejected eternal life. And he chose death. <laughs> if you are not following here, you get lost in the tracks. So fo just follow carefully. So he rejected immortality and accepted mortality. And this mortality is death. And that was the beginning of the reign of death. That was the beginning of the reign of sin. That was the beginning of the reign of evil. When Adam sinned, that was the beginning of of all the things we see today. So he became a sinner and died after he disobeyed the word of God. So when Adam transgressed against God, he became spiritually dead. Now, spiritual death became his nature. And spiritual death produced physical death. And this fallen state of man is what gave man now the what we see today. Man sins, man thinks evil, man does evil. Why the nature? Follow carefully. So, did well, quick question. If you ask a question, was God surprised when Adam sinned? No. God knew that Adam was going to eat that forbidden fruit. God knew it. That's why before he created Adam, he had already put a plan of salvation for man. So the, the sin of Adam was not a shock to God. He was not like, wow, I never knew that. No. 
He saw it. He knew it. And he put a plan to redeem man from the Messiah. He put himself there. That's why I say God does not react. He proacts. So God has foreknowledge. He sees ahead of time and plans ahead of time. That's why we say God's foreknowledge. He creates while knowing the outcome. Okay? So first, now let me, let, 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 let's say this. He had faith. Now you can say, okay, if God knew that Adam was going to sin, why did he create him? He had faith that all oh, Adam would obey him. Remember, God gave man the uh, capacity to obey and gave man the capacity to disobey. So Adam had all it takes to not eat from the tree of good and evil. And he had all it takes to eat from it. It's not like God determined or, or, or said, Adam, you are going to eat from it. No. God knew the outcome is this. That's why he advised Adam. He says, if you eat the tree of evil, you will die. What is he telling him? He's telling him this tree is not good. Eat from the tree of life. Which means God knows that Adam might eat from it. But God still comes because he loves man. He gives him advice. This is what you need to choose. You see that? Which means that God never forced man to choose. He gave him a choice to choose. Man had the power to choose. But Adam rejected the, the tree, the eternal life, the immortality, the Christ, the gospel. The gospel began in the Eden. The gospel began with Adam. Alright? Now when Adam ate the fruit, he was spiritual death. And when he is in spiritual death, he cannot help himself. He cannot help himself. That's why God had already put a plan for Jesus to come and redeem man. Is it not our Jesus glorious? Jesus is glorious. So now, the resurrection of Christ was also preached to Adam through the promise of the seed that would crush the serpent's head. The promise of resurrection. Uh, and also God in Eden, he slew a lamb to cover their nakedness as a communication that Jesus would be our righteousness. Remember, the Bible says you have, be, you have put on the new man, which is renewed after Christ. You have put on Christ. So when God slew the lamb and put uh, the skin clothings of Adam was a communication that Jesus would give us a new nature. He would be our covering. He would cover us, our shame, the nakedness. Jesus would cover all it up in himself and would be clothed with Christ. That's the communication in the book of Genesis there. And also, the thing that I normally say that when you are reading Genesis, you need to be careful. There are a lot of figures of speech there. Now look at Genesis chapter 3, 24. So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and the flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And I said this was not God chasing man. It was God pointing man back to eternal life. Pointing man back to life. So man was forever lost from the presence of God when we, you are reading Genesis chapter 3, 24. Man was lost from the presence of God. And he kept drifting away from God. Drifting away. Instead of coming close, he kept going away and pulling away from God. Being distant from God. So now, an eternal price had to be paid to redeem man. Because remember, man has been dead spiritually. So they needed to be a payment to redeem that man from death. So Adam kept running away from God. God kept pursuing man. God kept pursuing man. Remember, Adam hides from God. He's running away from God. Instead of running towards God, he runs away from God. He hides himself. But God still pursues man, goes after man, goes after man. Because why? He loves man. He loves us. That's why you know I, I say he did not put the angels, one, notice this. He did not put the angels to prevent man from eating the tree of life. It, he pointed man back to Christ. In other words, I'm pointing you back to who is the solution of the mess you have entered in. Right away. 
All right. So now that is the root problem. That is the problem. Firstly, before we deal with Enoch and Elijah, we go back to that place. That was the beginning of sickness, natural disasters, the catastrophes. Whatever we see, the rapes, the murders, the wars, the hunger, the famines, all the things we see in the world, that was the beginning. There's that spiritual death. Now, please get me now what I'm about to say. The spiritual death of man meant that man could only have one destiny. Man could only have one destiny. And that would be eternal damnation. Eternal damnation means separation away from God for all eternity. You can call it eternal hellfire. Man was doomed for eternity to be without God, away from God. Because of physical death. Okay. What sin entered, what sin caused Adam to enter into spirit, to get, what, sorry, what sin brought spiritual death? Rejection of the gospel. Rejection of Christ. What sin determined the end of man would be hell, eternal damnation. Rejection of the gospel. Rejection of Christ. Now, not this. So, unless a price would be paid, the destiny could not be altered. Unless the price is paid, the destiny could never be altered or changed. <laughs> that's why you know I say whether you are righteous by moral standards or you are very very the sinner of all <laughs> let me tell you the moralist and the and the person the criminal all of them they, they share the same the same place in hell the same chamber if there are chambers if there are rooms in hell all of them they share the same room there is whether you are a moralist you do good you try and be holy no difference you are a sinner by nature and when you die, my friend, it doesn't matter how many moral codes you have upheld, how nice you have been, whether you fasted the whole year, staying inside, never lying, doing all those things. By the nature which you have, you have been determined by Adam that your end result is eternal damnation. And it cannot be changed unless there is a propitiation. Unless a ransom is paid to justify you, there is no hope for you. You would end up in hell. That's why, you know, God looked and said, who can save man? Man cannot save himself. Do you know, have you ever asked yourself, why did we need Jesus to die? Because on the cross? All right, so you know that the death on the cross was not the most terrifying thing. In fact, Jesus died with two of the thieves. And not the only that, there were people before him who were also crucified in the same way. So if that's the price, I mean, was there no man who could not go on the cross? I'm not trying to downplay the velocity of uh, the cross. But I'm showing you something. If the big deal was the cross, the sufferings on the cross... Then it was not a big deal because, you know, the murderers, criminals, they were also executed that way. But what's so special about Jesus is that Jesus has not just come for the cross to, to just die. You know, many Christians, that's how they see. When they are looking at the Bible, they see the suffering of Jesus. They end up on the cross. You know, Jesus died on the cross. They hammered the nail here. The blood came out of his hand. That blood that came out of his hand was the blood to purify your hands. That blood that came from the hand was to purify your mind. That blood came from his chest was to produce sons. I, I don't know, all the sorts of things. But let me tell you, I can say this. The, 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 the sufferings, the beatings, the nails, the blood on the cross, it had, let me say, let me try to be fair and say it had 0.0.1% of the work in salvation. That's how you know many people, when they hear Jesus says, all is finished. They say, okay, you know, on the cross he has paid the price, the debt is paid, justice is saved. No, 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 you are not right, man. When Jesus says, all is finished. Is meaning the prophecies, the declaration of prophets, all of them, they end here. They are fulfilled now. It's meaning this is what is fulfilled. The utterance of the prophets, they are fulfilled. Because now when Jesus dies, when Jesus gives up his ghost, that's when the work of salvation begins. 
The work of salvation did not begin when he's being beaten, when he's on the cross. No, it begins when the Bible says he gave up his ghost. But now, when you go back, it begins from the point where Jesus says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why that point, he became spiritual dead. Why he's separated now from God. Now he became our sin. He took our sin. That's why the whole world turned into darkness. So the death of Jesus, the beginning, when he says, the Bible says he gave up his ghost, that was the beginning of the, sal- the work of salvation. That is the actual beginning of salvation there. Because why? Let me, let me tell you now. Let me answer the question. Why God did not need a mere man to die on the cross? It's because of this. If a man comes and let's say, for example, if God says, you know, I will send uh, brother Moses to come and die for you on the cross. That brother Moses, the first thing, that man is spiritual dead. So he cannot help himself. He cannot help you. But let me assume that brother Moses is able to go on the cross. The big deal is this. That man has to ascend into hell to pay an eternal price. And the eternal price which should be paid, it should be paid by an eternal spirit. And because of the sin of Adam, man has a mortal spirit or a temporal spirit. (laughs) The spirit is spiritual dead. So by an eternal spirit, an eternal price has to be paid in hell. Which means that no man, no man, whether that man was righteous by all standard moral, that man, even if he could go on the cross, perfect, but now you need to be spiritual dead and enter into hell. How can you do that? You have no eternal spirit. That's why God looked and said, no man can save man. So what should I do? I will go myself. Why? Because I alone am the one who who can provide that payment of the eternal price. That's why, you know, Jesus comes with an eternal spirit. He died for us. He is separated from God. Then what does the Bible say? He descended into hell to pay an eternal price by an eternal spirit. That's why when he pays the price, now he resurrects to come and justify you and me. That's why God needed himself to die on the cross, to descend into hell. Why? Because he alone can provide the payment of an eternal spirit. That was the ransom we are talking about. To save man from the fires of hell. For all eternity. For all eternity. You know, that's why you realize that even the gods under the Old Testament, they could not save. They they never even removed the sin. They covered the sin. (laughs) That's why the Bible says, the Bible says that Jesus, when he died on the cross, his atonement even covered for the past sin. For their sins. The legal charge that stood there. From the old. Why? Because their sins were not obliterated. The sins were not blotted. The sins were still there. Yet what just the gods did was to cover the sins. And if they made a mistake and in that year the sacrifice was not received, all the sins could be uncovered. Then they would receive a full punishment. Let's say they sinned for 40 years, right? And they've been covering, 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 covering. Then let's say today they faulted. They made a mistake and the atonement of sin, which the priest goes into the tabernacle, is rejected. All those sins they did 40 years would be revisited. All of them and the punishment for 40 years could come upon them. So it covered the sins. But what does John 1, 29 say to 36? The Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Jesus does not come only to... He does not cover your sins, my my brother. He does not cover them. He removes them. He completely erases them. That's why, you know, when you read the word like remission of sin, forgiveness of sin, it's meaning this way. Imagine a criminal has killed a lot of people in the past. He's a a drug dealer. This guy has kidnapped many people. He has trafficked many people. He has robbed many people. He has killed multiple times. You've looked for this robber. Then let's say, at the moment you catch the robber, let's say the judge comes and says, you know, "Ah, I forgive you. Now, when he says he remits the sins, that means even the record, it is wiped. That means when that criminal comes before the court, then they say, brother, you killed people in the past. When he says, no, I did not kill anyone. Okay. They go to the records. 
there is no record to show that you committed the crimes. Why? Because that's what we call remissions of sin. Your sins have not only been covered. Jesus removes them completely. So when you are standing before God, there is no record of sin. No record at all. God is seeing you blank, white, pure as you are. Of course, you are the only one who accuses yourself. When you go before God, you begin to say, um, God, you see, I did today this, I lied, I still, I, I thought about this, I, I had evil intentions. You are already accusing yourself. God is not accusing you, you are already accusing yourself. But God even, when he's looking at you, even when you are speaking that, <laughs> God is just saying this, he's saying, huh, you are a great man, you just don't know who you are. Your sins have been obliterated. Your sins have been blotted out. They have been removed. There is no record that you have done that. God has totally erased that. Whilst yet you condemn yourself. Whilst you have been forgiven. So the sacrifice of Jesus does not come to cover your sins. It comes to erase your sins. The record of sins. No record of sins. That's why when you stand before God, you should see yourself as a man who has no record of sins. That's why I like how Papa puts it. He says, righteousness is the ability to stand before God without a feeling of inferiority complex, without of shame, guilt, or sin consciousness. You have Jesus consciousness. When you stand before God, your consciousness is Jesus. The reason that many of us, you know, we are condemned, we condemn ourselves, we are like, oh man, I did this, I don't feel like worthy of, of coming to God. Lord, the first thing you do when you are praying, you are like, God, I confess my sins. Lord, before you, I'm a crocroach, you know, I'm nothing before you, I'm a worthless. Ash. Does the word of God say you are worthless? Where are you getting that? The Bible says you have been paid, redeemed with a price. Glorify God in your, in your flesh. How are you saying you are worthless? God is looking and says, wow, who told you are worthless? Adam, who told you are naked? Who told you are worthless? Before you are made like a crocroach, who said you are a crocroach? You are, but all that prayer is because of the result of sin consciousness. Because you are condemning yourself. Your heart is condemning yourself. So you are there, you are, oh God, forgive me this, I did this, I did this. Even the confession of our sins itself is the manifestation of sin consciousness. Why? Because you realize God has forgiven your past sins, your present sins, your future sins, all of them. That's why he's not coming to die again. He completely, he paid what we call elasmos, elaskomai. It's a satisfaction. It's a payment, an eternal payment. Of sins and satisfaction. That means all your sins you committed when you were born, when you were alive, and the sins you have been not yet committed. Jesus has already forgiven them. Oh, you would say, no, no, no. How are you saying that? Let me let me ask you this. Your great, great grandchildren will get born. Are their sins already paid for? Or will Jesus need to die? No. So Jesus has paid a price that covers eternity past to eternity future. But when you come, you begin to say, Oh, Lord, I did this. Forgive me. It's a manifestation of sin consciousness. You are not yet feeling how righteous you are. And the problem is that you are proud. You are looking at yourself. You are focusing on yourself. Now, let me tell you. Focus your eyes on Jesus. Look unto Jesus. Look unto, unto Jesus. When you come before God, when the devil throws a sin at your, uh, at your mind, he says, you know, from one minute you are from doing this, just download Jesus' consciousness straight. Say, begin to say what the word of God says you are. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm purified. I'm cleansed. I'm justified. I'm glorified. I'm redeemed. I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm eternal saved. I'm eternal forgiven. Jesus is my intercessor. He's my advocate. I've been forgiven. I've been sealed unto the day of redemption. I have the adoption. I'm the son of God. I'm justified. I'm cleansed. I have eternal. That's, those are the things you speak yourself. You speak to yourself that way. You never stop. Mm -hmm. That is what we call Jesus consciousness. That's why you know many people understand to pray. They're like, Father, um, Father, in the name of Jesus, do this. Uh, uh, brother. Jesus has already done it. You are left to receive. There is nothing God is going to do for you. He has done it. You are left to receive. But when you know what Christ has done for you, you don't stand and say, Father, I, uh, please, you see, uh, I need that jacket. Please, Lord, please, please. You are begging, please, Lord, <laughs> I need that. No. 
You stand as a bold man. You take your place in Christ. You pray in the name of Jesus. That jacket, I have it. Right? What are you doing? You are taking your place in righteousness. Why? Because, you know, I love something that Papa said. Well, if you have watched the series of prayer, I think it is, uh, ans- there are no answers to answers to prayer do not come from heaven. And if you watch that other series, uh, the myth of an answered prayer, Papa said something, a powerful statement that you will know, never forget. He says, the beginning of prayer begins with the sense of righteousness. That's where prayer begins. When you begin that way, you've got it. Prayer begins with a sense of righteousness. And I would encourage you, go type uh, the, the myth of an unanswered prayer or the answers to prayer in heaven by Dr. Abedamel. We see it. He, get, he, he explained the parable of, uh, of I think, the, the parable of impotence. The woman who goes and knocks on the door of the re, of the judge several times, comes again, knocks many times, many things. And Jesus, you know, was teaching prayer many a lot of places. And he says, prayer begins with a sense of righteousness. That's where you begin. Because when you know you are righteous, you don't come to beg and say, Lord, God, please, I need, please, please, Lord. You see, see, I've been praying a long time. I've been praying. I've been praying every day for two years. It has not come, please. No. You realize you take your place in Christ. Then you pray. Because, you know, as Jesus is, so are you. What did Jesus say? Father, I thank you that you hear me always. Does God hear you always? Yes. And so if you are, that's why I say, if you are struggling, if many people have told you, you know, sometimes when you pray, God says no. When you pray, he says yes. When you pray, he says no, this is not good for you. <laughs> I would encourage you, go and watch Papa's series. Doctor, just tab, to tab it, I mean, uh, and ask the myth of an answered prayer, uh, understanding prayer. You, I'm telling you, it will change your mind. There is nothing like an ananas, an answered prayer. Before you pray, God answers. If you read Daniel chapter 9, when Daniel begins to pray, Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 to 3, when Daniel is just praying, in just like some minutes, two or three minutes or less than that, an angel appears and say, the moment you set your heart to understand these things, God sent me to give you an answer. Which means before you said, Father, God sent me to answer. So God looked and said, you need this and he provided ahead of time. So before Daniel prayed, God had already answered. Even in the, chapter, in the later chapters when Daniel prays and the angel comes for 21 days, the angel does not say, you know, you prayed. Then uh, God was reviewing and was saying, he was looking if it, it, it is his will to give you. No, the angel said, the moment you set your heart to understand these things, the Lord answered and sent me to give an answer. But I was resisted by the prince of Persia. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, do not worry about these things for your father knows your needs. And what has he done? He has provided beforehand. God knows you are going to need this. God knows you are going to need this. And has provided it beforehand. He has given it beforehand. So what do you do? You come to receive. When you are praying, you are receiving. You are taking, you are taking place in authority. Then receiving it. That's why you know, I like a, a, a post in Papa's group. You know, It was stop praying to God and pray as God. When you are praying to God, you are praying from a place of defeat. You are praying, Lord, I need you to do. And God will not do because he has already done. That's why you find many Christians, Lord, please stop, speak to us, speak to us, speak to us. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Now in the last days, God has spoken through his son. Not through his son. He has spoken by himself. He himself speaks in his son. So God has, speak, he has spoken. The Bible does not say he will speak. He is speaking. He has spoken in this last day. He has spoken. So if you are praying, please God speak, speak, brother. God is already speaking. He has already spoken. What do you need? Go into the Bible. Find what he has spoken. Hmm. Hallelujah. So you need to take your place in righteousness to know that prayer begins with the consciousness of righteousness. Jesus consciousness. Then you begin to pray as God, not for to God. You don't go, Father, in the name of Jesus, heal this person. No, the power is already there. You pray, Father, in Jesus' name, this person is healed. You declare the word of God. He's healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And the power of God is available. 
more than available. Available. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why you know it is very, very vital that you know you realize all these things. And so the series of prayer is available then. So you know today that's that will be the my end of the introduction. Today we are going through the introduction. So this is part one. So remember, as I said, if you haven't followed this, please after this broadcast, go back, watch it, take notes, look at it. If I did not give you some lies, and so if you see it's okay. If you see there are some things there that I do not, then you are free to come and say, you know, uh, you, you said something, but you know, I did not find it. So, you know, and you know, it's important for you to get from this part one and part two, which will come tomorrow because, you know, it's been in sequences. And, you know, I know so the answer, the, the doctrinal answers, they are at the end. But, you know, it's a foundation to get to us started. So we discussed first, Adam was not mortal. He was neither immortal. He was given the chance to choose between mortality and immortality. He rejected immortality. He chose mortality. He was not a sinner. He was not holy. He was not righteous. He was not unrighteous. He was stuck in between. And he chose to be a sinner. He rejected life. He rejected holiness. He rejected righteousness. He rejected purity. And he chose a sinner state. So, which means that Adam was neither sinner, he was neither righteous, he was neither mortal, he was neither immortal. He was given a chance to choose between two, and he chose death, he chose to be a sinner. So, and we say now, by that virtue, death passed to every man. Every man born under Adam must die. <laughs> Why? Now, God comes and says, from dust you came, from dust thou shalt return. What is he meaning? Thus you came, you will die. Is meaning the death of the flesh. So every man born under Adam must die. Uh, must deposit the body, the flesh, back into the dust. Back into the dust. Because now Adam has set forth a law in the motion. That law is, I will go back to the dust. And that law cannot be violated. So that's why if it is Enoch, if it is Elijah, if it is any man, any man who, as long as he's born under Adam, that body has to go back to dust. So this kind of foundation will continue. Tomorrow part two, it will be the regime of death. Now, if you are following this path, it will come handy. If you don't follow this path from part one to part two, you will remain with many questions unanswered. But let me let me plead with you this that if you do, you do not follow part one and tomorrow you do not follow part two, let me say this: don't uh, be quick to comment or just say I would beg that you go back again part one, watch again until when you see you have no you have understood. Anyways, I can say this that all these things which I am uh, I'll be sharing with you, I compiled them into a PDF or I can say into notebook which you know is available, e-copy, for free. You can just request it about this so you can read ahead about everything that we, we, we will say. You can read ahead before you know I finish. You can read ahead when I'm just teaching. You'll be like, ah, oh, wow, I read that, okay? I understood. You can read it. So it's a PDF. It's, it's not, I don't call it a book, even though it looks like a book. Yes, I, yes, I made it to be attractive right so i put a uh, a front cover a front a back page it's just like in the format of books it has the table of contents i don't know if i can show it to you it has the table of contents so everything i think let me show it to you so this is the 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 pdf right it's a book right uh, so i compiled it down this last year last year that's when i compiled it down so if you see this the cover, let me see. This is the cover. So this is the cover now. When you scroll up, you are going to see the introduction, of course. Yeah, it's, it's not a book, but you know, this is how I chose to put it. So you will see the table of contents. You can see there the table of contents. You can see everything there. So as I say, it is for free. It's not for sale. And it's not a book. It's just a PDF that I compiled because I know some people they are not patient in watching videos so a book would be of greater help 
and it's an ebook so you can get it for free just text me or comment you know i need it then i will go, get back to you or send a message through whatsapp my numbers are on the page you you can go to the page and you will see the numbers or you just let me know in the comments i need this and i will just come to you and say okay text me here or i will give, I will give you the details that you need so that i can send you the the e-copy so you can read it uh i mean that that's so glorious and you know it's 86 pages long and it's not 86 big pages it's just small pages small pages i i i tell you you can read it in seven hours you are done but uh yeah seven hours is too much all right so that's that was today the origin of the root the origin of the root so kind of what we're talking about the origin of the root when we look the origin of the root we say death began from adam sin began from adam so this sin began from adam death began from adam and death this death passed unto all men you get what i'm saying so right so tomorrow we'll come back again here and we'll continue with part two so invite people this is just the beginning if you haven't listened go back to part one and listen so let me see if i have some questions before i just cut the broadcast off if you have any question, feel free to drop it. All right, if you don't have a question, that's perfect. You know, you, you can always type in the comment section if you have any question. So let me just close the broadcast. i see you soon. Father, we bless your name for everybody who has been here live, watching us live and listening to your word. We pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that the eyes of our understanding are enlightened, that we may know and see the truth. And we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for this week. We thank you for this series. We are blessed. We are edified. And you alone are glorified. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for their lives. And we pray for them wherever they are, that in the name of Jesus, whatever concerns them, in Jesus' name, it is all that in the mighty name above every name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. All right. See you back uh, once again. Okay. Let me see. Right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> let me just give you. Let me just type my number there for WhatsApp so that you can uh, reach me on WhatsApp. So that I can send it to you on WhatsApp. Or if you do not, if you do not use WhatsApp, you can tell me. I can give you my email so that uh you can send it to me through my email yeah i think the number is down there plus one seven seven two triple eight zero double eight nine that's my whatsapp number i will immediately when you just type a book i need a book i will just send it to you directly if you don't use whatsapp feel free to let me know that you use email I will get back to you. Well, brothers and sisters, I'm happy that you joined us uh, live. Continue to join us. Tomorrow is part two. We are continuing and it's never ending. And listen, there is a lot of things that, you know, we, we'll be learning here that, you know, will blow your mind. We'll be looking at it scripturally, looking verse to verse about this matter. And it will settle it once and for all. So that, you know, it is not that only so that you get this knowledge. No, it's that after you get it, then someone asks you, he says, you know, uh, Elijah and what died? You are like, yes. Oh, it's like, no, 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 no way. How did that? Then when you begin to get the question, you begin to answer the questions. You begin to answer the questions. That's very, very great. And, you know, very, very wonderful. But some people, you know, they will always ask, is this beneficial to salvation? Hey, let me tell you, this is... This is part of us learning, equipping yourself to give a defense. Paul says, be ready to give a defense for what you believe in, for your faith. If you go to any person and ask you a question, you should be ready to give a defense for every place. So every topic in the scriptures, it should not be ignored. Every topic, not topic, as long as it is in the scriptures, we have to address it. We do not have to ignore it and say, okay, we turn a blind eye to it. No, we have to address the issue. We do not have to say, okay, you know, Enoch never uh, did not die. You know, we don't want to touch that. No, we touch it so that we come out with clarity. That's the reason the, doc the scriptures are there, to make us know. Hallelujah. So see you once again. Love you all. Tune in tomorrow.
at this same time tomorrow. I see you back again. Love you so much. Evie Fabrice signing out from Canada. Amen. Everybody, bless. Have a wonderful.